Hi guys and welcome to Quick Guys for Medicine. My name is Fatai, I'm a hospitalist here in South Carolina. Today I'll be going over DKA, the thought process from the diagnosis to the management. You know, sometimes it feels like a lot of the management of DKA is somewhat protocolized where the order sets and all of the things are there, but it's still very important the U.S. clinician understand, first of all, how to make the diagnosis and moving forward, how to manage effectively and un understand some of the complications that, that comes uh, uh, with DKA. So basically here, we'll, we'll start with DKA. Uh, I always like to say that the name, the, the diagnosis is in the name for DKA. So if you were to break this down further, we will say diabetic keto acidosis so based on diagnostic criteria what we have here is glucose of above 250 all right the keto here basically says is serum ketones not urine ketones serum ketones and if we have to be specific here we'll say beta hydroxy butyrate beta hydroxybutyrate are, are there for DKA and the acidosis has several components to it. Uh, you can say the anion gap, the bicarb and the pH but I would always like to start with anion gap because I'll explain why. Um, so anion gap, if we're assuming the anion gap average is about 12 so you can say anion gap above 12, uh, bicarb for the mild DKA will be bicarb less than 18 and then you can say pH less than 7.3. What happens a lot of times is that you have a patient who's coming uh, uh, for DKA, well, who's coming with hyperglycemia, and you know people don't really think about DKA sometimes, uh, and then they don't get uh, a blood gas that will be able to get your pH. How do you know in that patient that there might be DKA? It goes back to anion gap because you know in many instances your pH could be normal meaning it's not less than 7.3, but then there is still DKA. Your bicarb could be normal, you know, it's not less than 18, but then there is still DKA. How do you know when you have elevated anion gap? Pretty much this is how you look at it. Um, whenever you have elevated anion gap, by default, there is elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. So that's where you always begin. But then you also understand in DKA, you know, some of these patients have hyperventilation, closed mouth breathing, that could then somewhat, you know, the, the pH, the acidotic pH that you would have seen in metabolic acidosis sort of normalizes because of a, con uh, you know, a concurrent respiratory alkalosis from the hyper uh, ventilation. You could also have in that same patient, you know, DKA patient, one of the main presenting signs or symptoms would be vomiting, right? They're throwing, they're throwing up a lot, you know, they're throwing all that, you know, uh, 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 acid out and then they go into metabolic alkalosis. So again, your bicarb could sort of normalize. So you have sort of normal bicarb, sort of normal pH, but then elevated anion gap, you still have to say it is DKA because here you know there is other acid-based disorders happening at the same time. The, the, the real risk with this is if you don't identify DKA in a patient like that and you don't put them on the appropriate treatment, things can get bad and then before you transfer them from the regular flows to the IC, there's some delay, you know, they, they can't start the inf uh, insulin infusion, for example, things go south from there. Yeah, it doesn't mean that you can't manage mild DKA with regular insulin injections, for example, but if it is DKA, the best thing is to manage appropriately, which will be insulin infusion that typically should be done in a critical care setting, in an ICU setting. So this, from the name, this is the, the diagnosis. So basically, when you make a diagnosis of DKA, there's several things that you want. First of all, the management is, is quite straightforward. It's going to be insulin, right, infusion, and IV fluids. You know, the insulin infusion, we're talking about regular insulin here, 
right, regular insulin with IV fluids. The IV fluid of choice would depend on what, if, what, what is actually happening with the patient. Um, we already know that normal saline, for example, could cause or potentially to worsen met metabolic acidosis. So it may not necessarily be the best fluid of choice. In general, according to the SMART trial, we know that you know LR or balanced crystalloids tend to do better than you know, fluids like uh, normal saline, so I would probably prefer to use LR. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to worry about the potassium with LR, even though you know the LR contains potassium. For you to get enough potassium that will raise the potassium levels in these patients, you have to give up a whole bunch of, you know, LR. But in this situation, again, you also remember that when you have hyperkalemia and DKA, the hyperkalemia is, is sort of not real. Because you know, because of the insulin deficiency in that patient, majority of potassium that should have been in the intracellular space is out in the extracellular space because of lack of insulin. And once you start to give insulin infusion, you will push a lot of that potassium back into the cells and you might have a risk of, you know, very serious hypokalemia. Um, my fluid of choice still remains, you know, LR uh, as a maintenance fluid. In the bolus phase where you're just trying to load them up with fluids it probably doesn't matter as much but for maintenance reasons LR will be uh, uh, my, my preferred and again you have to know exactly what's happening LR is contraindicated with for example patients with traumatic brain injury because of the slight hypotonicity compared to serum you have to consider the the specific scenario to be able to make uh, a safe or sure what fluid you're going to use but again uh, by default LR is, is typically okay to use so this is the treatment but the very important thing with DKA is DKA doesn't just happen by itself. So you always have to track back and say, what, ha what caused the DKA? I would like to look at it in three ways. Um, I must have heard this mnemonic sometime, you know, in the past, but I just, I just stuck to it. So if you say three I's, for example, you can say infection, all right, as a cause of DKA, you can say infarction and then you can say for a patient who's who's already has uh who's already had uh, uh diabetes and we're supposed to be an insulin and they're non-compliant with it you can say insulin non-compliance another one that i tend to add with my students recently is to you know throw in their new onset diabetes for example May, patient doesn't know that they have diabetes and you know they come with a very high sugar level and that's the reason why they went into DKA and nobody knew about this. Infection and infarction, first of all, you know in both scenarios you have some sort of inflammatory response. That inflammatory response is what tends to throw the, the glycemic control for this patient out of whack and that's why they, they get DKA. The problem is if you don't address these things, for example, infection, infection and infarction. Infarction, for example, an MI, because inflammatory response following an MI could cause DKA. You know, a large stroke could cause DKA. Pancreatitis could cause DKA because all of these things are tissue, tissue and cell death that is accompanied by inflammatory response that would then, you know, throw the glycemic control out of balance. Um, so, again, recapping, this is very short stuff. DKA, start with the diagnosis. Right, start with the diagnosis and make sure that your, your diagnosis at least fits the diagnostic criteria. Glucose of more than 250, serum, ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate, specifically an elevated iron gap. The reason why this is equally very important is our treatment endpoint is basically to say that the iron gap has closed, meaning the iron gap is normalized. It means that the patient is out of DKA for the most part. And you may not necessarily be able to depend on these other things because some, multiple things may be going on that you won't be able to depend on the bicarb or the pH. So iron gap closing means that you then have to transition from in insulin infusion to subcutaneous insulin, which will be what they eventually continue to use beyond that DKA episode. Another very important point I'll quickly add before we round off is with uh, uh, anion gap, you could have a falsely closed anion gap if you don't correct it for albumin. Some of these patients are malnourished. If you have very low albumin, there's a chance that your anion gap could be falsely low, so you have to make the correction. It's just important to, to remember that. Um, but anyways, this is DK in a nutshell. I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye-bye.